Hello. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, we're good. We're comfortable. I yes. love your sweatshirt. That's super Thank cool. you. I love, ah. I love that. So wait, did you say you got some really good news today? Uh, I, I just got busier than I expected. Is there than expected? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. My um, my agent reached out to me and and sent me this audition, and I was like, oh, I don't want to do this one. Just I don't want to do this one. He was like, You're gonna do this one, and I'm gonna send you someone to do it with. And I'm like, oh, All right. So do you normally get to like pick and choose which auditions you're going to take and which ones you don't, or is it kind of like. I, I always have the option to pick what auditions I want to do or don't do. Um, it's a very, very rare day in which I don't do my auditions. Very, very rare. I think in the past four years, I've only canceled about three or four of them. Okay. And they're all for some sort of valid reason. The reason why I didn't want to do this one was because it was a couple's audition. So mm -hmm. it would require me to go contact somebody to pretend to be a couple with me. And then we got to get in the same room. We got to prep everything together. I got to make sure they're available. Like I got to make sure I'm like putting together all the chemistry. It's just like, I'd rather just do solo auditions. <laughs> I don't want to deal with another person. Yeah, no, that's that. I. I can understand that like the the labor like energetically that's required in order to put something like that together is just like mm -hmm. not today i don't want to do that today so yeah i feel you yeah. I understand. no and it actually worked out timing wise um i'm in a like a co-working space and so rarely you know is there any anyone else in here but today there was a gentleman who was working on recording some content and so it just worked out that our schedules kind of like overlapped a little bit so mm -hmm. the delay here actually created space for him to be able to wrap up what he needed to do so everything always works out um well let me just begin by saying thank you so much for saying yes to being a, a guest on this podcast i I started this podcast years ago and never really knew exactly what direction it was gonna go. I just knew that I loved having conversations. I love talking to people. I love connecting with different people and learning more about how people move in the world. And so when I started reaching out to folks that I either met in real life, you know, or met through social media, just to be able to kind of learn a little bit more about their story, because I think that everyone's story is really unique and everyone's story has a unique way of impacting the world. And whether you're super, super, super famous or you're nobody knows your name, I think that there's something that happens when I connect with certain people that makes me want to just lean in and learn a little bit more. And you mm. are one of those people. So I just want to say thank you again for, um, for saying yes to this and for creating the time to sit and chat with me. I'm going to give you the, the mic, the floor, so to speak, and just give you a moment to introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers just by telling us your name, where you're from, and what you stand for. Mm -hmm. I can do that. Okay. My name is Hallelujah. Um, it's the name I go by. I also go by Hallie, but most people call me Hallelujah. I am a creative and also a life coach. My creativity, it stems in music, acting, modeling, um, hosting, like TV hosting after shows and things of that sort. Uh, I, prefer, I prefer bumper car racing over long walks on the beach. I will argue with anyone that popcorn is a food group. And I find that to be far more important compared to what I do because it's just, it's just a lot of fun. <laughs> and I stand for authenticity, like showing up within myself and powerfully and inspiring others to do the same. I love that. I love that. I would also argue that popcorn is a food group. I love popcorn. Yeah! <laughs> I love popcorn. Okay, we can hang out now. Yeah, we, we, we can, can hang out now. Okay, now we can get a <laughs> connection here. Exactly. I love popcorn. My dad also loves popcorn. It's part of his like, well, it used to be like nightly routine. Now it's maybe like two or three times a week just because, you know, he wanted to get a little healthier. But I love even like old school popcorn that you make on the stove. Like I remember like Jiffy Pop popcorn. Or, like, yeah, popcorn. I did. I did that too. I, yeah, yeah. 
there's something different about like stovetop popcorn versus microwave popcorn versus movie popcorn. I feel like mm. we could probably have a whole conversation just about popcorn. We can, <laughs> and I, I actually have my own popper at home and it's an air popper, so it's pretty bomb too. And I went out of my way and also bought the special popcorn containers that you can get at the theaters. Like I am a connoisseur. One of my, my exes years ago actually bought me a full on popcorn maker for Christmas. The moment I saw it, I just hugged it and I just laid on the couch. I didn't move for about 10 minutes. I think I teared up a little bit too. Don't tell anyone. Like you know you see me. <laughs> you see me. Exactly. I love, I love that. I also love that you said you prefer racer car racer cars, bumper cars versus long walks on the beach. Tell me a little bit more about that. Cause I know like some people are like, I love long walks on the beach because it's peaceful and blah blah blah. Why the bumper cars? Um am I allowed to cuss? You're allowed to. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I didn't give the disclaimer. I normally do this beforehand. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, <laughs> you can express yourself in whatever language or movement feels real for you. You can also take up as much or as little space as you like as you respond to some of my questions. So take it away. Yes. Great. I'm going to be extremely layman about this. Are you ready? I'm ready. Sometimes I just like to bump into shit. It's so that's funny. literally that's literally it yeah. sometimes sometimes i prefer to bump into shit compared to just going for a walk that's yeah. it there's <laughs> something about the 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 contact i think that happens with bumper cars you know i haven't been in a bumper car and i don't know how long but i remember going to like the there used to be like this boardwalk arcade vibe out in santa monica i don't think it's i don't think the bumper cars are there anymore but i would go as a kid and it was like the most fun thing to like chase people around and just be like, ah, and just like run into them. No, you know, not causing any injury, of course, but just for fun. But I like that. I like to bump into shit. Sometimes we need that. Exactly. And I have absolutely no shame about my rage. Sometimes I just want to bump into shit. And for instance, um, I think it was about a month, a month ago. Yeah, I went to a, a break room. Do you know what that is? A break room. Is it like where you can like take like a hammer or a bat? Yeah, and you just go and break shit. Yeah, that's so good. I, I just I just felt like doing it. That's part of the reason why I'm hardly if ever angry mm. about things because I always make sure I do things to let out my angers and let or let out my anger and let out my frustrations. Yeah, I think that's such a healthy. It's so interesting because we think about like self care and we think about like long baths and massages and <laughs> you know, soothing activities and while those activities I think do have value I think that the expression or the exertion of rage and anger is something that we don't necessarily think of when we think of self-care and so mm -hmm. that I saw a break room I haven't actually been yet but the first time that I saw one I was like this is so brilliant because the expression of rage is often shamed as like well, you're not supposed mm -hmm. to do that, especially for women or people who identify as female, that it's like, well, no, you're not, you're supposed to just like write a mean letter and then burn it or something, but you're never <laughs> supposed to actually get the shit out. So I love that. I love that. Were you encouraged to express rage and anger when you were growing up? Is that something that was real for you? Was I encouraged? You know, the moment you said it, there was no particular memory that popped in mind. I trained myself to become comfortable with my own emotions, whatever range that it is. And, uh, you know, it's so funny thinking on it now. I think I more so taught my parents how to manage their rage and, and let it out, not be ashamed. I'm... I'm a firm believer in as above, so below. I don't really put much shame on any type of emotion or, or behavior or thought process. I just see it as is. I don't have a story behind anything. So if I feel angry, I'm going to look at that anger and I'm gonna let it out. If I feel sad, I'm gonna look at that sadness and, and let it out. And it's just, for me, it's a matter of doing it in a way that is healthy for me, effective for me, and it has little to no casualties. And thankfully I, I've, I haven't really had any, I'm, I'm just so self-aware for the most part that yeah, I just, 
I have no shame. I think that's what it is. I, I have no shame when it comes to my emotions or range of emotions. And I also understand that the body will hold on to it if you don't let it out in some sort of way. And some people, they use different outlets to let out rage that actually doesn't let out the rage. All it does is suppress it. Uh, for instance, um, sex, drugs, alcohol, codependency, um, uh, Netflix and chill, uh, just, just things of that sort, you know? And all it does is once again, mask it. It doesn't allow people to fully and utterly face exactly what's going on and, and deal with it. Um, like I said, I don't just go out and break things. Rah, 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 rah. There's a reason. <laughs> There's a reason and I'm aware of the reason and I'm generally aware of why I'm upset, but no no one no one taught me how to do this i went out and sought it and taught myself i love that i love that because you said something that really stuck out which is a lot of people have practices that just are tools of suppression as opposed mm -hmm. to methods of expression and i think that for us to really start to normalize the expression of anger and the expression of rage as part of our human experience instead of a mm -hmm. thing that's meant to be tucked away or a thing that's meant to, you know, to be shamed or not talked about until we get to the boiling point where there's so much rage and so much anger that's been suppressed over time, mm -hmm. we just go ape shit. You know what I mean? And and I think to what you mentioned earlier, it's not causing any um you know violence or any negative effect on other people it's like this is my expression of rage this is my expression of anger this is for me this is what i need to be able to get out this is what i need to be able to really move forward and if i continue to suppress it then it might actually affect other people in a negative way it might actually affect my ability to communicate my ability to connect and so I love this. I mean, I, what I love about these conversations is that I always kind of just start with an opener and kind of just see where it weaves and just like, there's a little bit of structure, but not a whole, whole lot. And that's why I love doing the podcast the way that I do it. When I think about just shame around the expression of emotion and how shame is this thing that I think some people wear as, as a, I don't know, almost like a badge of honor. Like, I don't express that and I don't know. And I, I would be, she should be ashamed of herself for doing this or <laughs> be ashamed of themselves. And it's like, who decided that they were gonna carry like this scepter of shame and just start applying it to people here and there? Who gave them the right to do that? You know, when in truth, human beings have a spectrum of emotion. And if mm -hmm. we're not allowing ourselves to really live within each wave of that spectrum, we're limiting our ability to really live. Exactly. And um, I really love that you brought that up. Oftentimes when people judge others for what they do, it's because they wish that they could do it themselves. They wish that they would feel comfortable enough or encouraged enough to actually say, you know what, I'm upset and I want to let it out too. And I think uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's part of the reason why you asked me that question. Who taught you this? Exactly. That's exactly okay. why. Exactly why. Because I, I think of, you know, if I think of my own experience, I think, you know, I'm the oldest of five, you know, five kids. I have younger siblings. Mm -hmm. And I remember having you know, little spats with my younger siblings, you know, my younger sister, we didn't get along or get off of my bed or get out of my room or get back my boy or whatever it is. And the, the, the rage that I would feel, you know, or the anger that I would feel at that time was never validated. You know, there was never mm -hmm. a space was created for me to really express that. It was kind of just like kiss and make up your family, your siblings, just put that away, you know? So the reason I ask that is because I don't know many people that I've had the privilege of being able to connect with that did have an environment where someone, an adult, a caretaker sat them down and said, go ahead and rage out, do what you gotta do, get it out, let it out, let the, let the tears fall, let the, mm -hmm. the hammer swing. I mean, not at a person, of course, but you know, like, let's go break some shit, you know, let's go bump into some shit. Like, I don't know a lot of people who had that modeled for them. And I think that as adults, we kind of start to discover these are things that I may have needed then, and I'm now able enough to give it to myself now. 
Right. I, for me, it's just because at some point in my life, I decided I'm not going to live for others. That's really what it came down to. And now that I think of it, uh, it was, it was my father who kind of instilled that in me. He, at a very young age, he would always tell me, Halo, do what you want to do and be successful at it. He, he raised me to be extremely independent and fierce and a champion in a way when, when he was in my life. Uh, and then my mother, she taught me that it was okay to feel. So I, I, I think I took a combination of both of those and said, this is what I'm going to do. I don't think they realized or expected how far I would take it, <laughs> but I ended up teaching them things along the way. But yeah, now that I think about it, they may not have taught me to be comfortable with my emotions, but in ways they taught me how to become comfortable within myself. And ironically, it took me having to completely and utterly separate from them and their expectations of me or, or from what I thought was their expectations of me in order to have complete and utter freedom. That's why I said, I don't live for anybody. I live vicariously through me. I love that. I love that. I live vicariously through me. That's so beautiful. It's, and, and I think we do have a unique ability to be able to teach our parents you know, I am a parent and my parents are still parenting us, you know, to a certain extent, obviously we're mm -hmm. adults, our relationship looks different. However, I do really enjoy those moments when I see a light go on from my mom and my dad, when we're talking about something that they're, they're having their, oh, I never thought about it that way experience. And so mm -hmm. that's, I think one of the beautiful parts about parenting is when your kids mature and they become adults, or even as they're young and they're still developing, if you're really paying attention and giving them the space to just be full expressions of themselves, there's so many opportunities for you to both teach and to learn from them. So, Absolutely. And as you get older, it becomes an even more beautiful transition because now you are, you, you're living the years and the ages that your parents lived when they raised you. So you can relate to them a lot more. So you take them off that pedestal and start to see them as a person rather than just your parent. And it's one of the most terrifying, uncomfortable, but beautiful experiences because now you you take this person, this really not even a person, but an entity, mm -hmm. an entity <laughs> and said, this is my hero. This is my first love. This is my everything. And you're deciding to go, hmm, actually it's just a person that I chose to idolize because I was so small that I couldn't help it. They, they taught me everything I knew, but now it's time for me to teach me. It's time for me to unlearn all the things I've ever known and teach myself and figure out what works for me and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's part of the, the transition from, you know, infant stages and then little, little person stages and then adolescent stages where you really start to identify who am I? What matters to me? Why am I? And I remember, you know, even with like um, nicknames, you know, like when your friends give you a nickname or you give yourself a nickname and your parents are like, why are they calling you that? And it's like, well, this is who I identify with. This is what I want to call myself now. And I remember, you know, going through that with my parents when I was in high school, my friends started calling me justice because I was super into law and I, you know, planned to go to law school. And I mm. law team. So all my friends called me justice. And I remember the first time my dad heard it, he was like, who is that? I was like, that's me. And he's like, you named you Keyshawn and blah, 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 blah. This is the whole story. And I'm like, I don't care. This is what I want to call myself now. You know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could tell dad, hey, you, you raised me to be this way. Like, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> you did this. You did this. I may not be doing it the way that you wanted me to, but you laid down the foundation. You gave me permission to be this person. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, speaking of names, your name is, is relatively unique. You know, the name Hallelujah is um is one that i don't think many people can say or hear without you know a little tingling of spirituality coming up for them what can you tell me a little bit more about your name how you how you got this name and, and what does it mean for you <laughs> i get this question all the time i'm all, I had all to the time it, otherwise it wouldn't be like an interview <laughs> <laughs> it's okay you know i get to also perfect my answer on this i think 
the reason why sometimes I struggle with answering it is because I don't think about it as much as other people do. I, I really don't. I just navigate my life and I'm copacetic. But I will answer your question for the sake of entertaining it. <laughs> I think so. Yes, yeah, so uh, my given name is Hallie, and Hallie is actually short for hallelujah. And hallelujah in Hebrew, it means praise the most high. And uh, it's honestly, it's so, it's so simple. My, for years, I went by my full name as my stage name. And every time I would get on stage, some MC would F it up. <laughs> would pronounce my name incorrectly. They couldn't say, and welcome to stage, Hallie. They would go, Hallie, Holly, Haley, Helly, Hale. And I'm like, and then I had to reintroduce myself to the crowd. Hi, everybody. My name is Hallie, and here's my song. Uh, it, it just got annoying. It got so annoying that no one can pronounce my name correctly. And even if I tell them, hey, my name is Hallie, they say, oh, Holly. No, 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 no. Hallie rhymes with Callie. That's right, Holly. Ugh. You know what? I'm done. So uh, it wasn't, it was early last year, late 2019. I just went on this journey of completely and utterly, utterly rebranding myself. And part of that was the name. I, I wanted um, to create an entity and a brand of myself that I could tolerate, really. Um, and the reason why I say that, it sounds so terrible, but I'll explain. Um, as an artist, it's easy to get lost in the identity of an artist mm -hmm. and not be just the person that's underneath that. For me, Hallelujah is a beautiful marriage and encompassing of me personally and then also me as an artist, but I also have the ability to compartmentalize myself uh, within that name too, because it's still a piece of me, but it's also a separate entity from me. Uh, yeah, so that, that's really what it is. It has nothing to do with any type of quote unquote religious factors. Um, I am very spiritual myself, so I understand why it, it can provoke feelings of spirituality. And, and you know what? Damn it. When I walk through the room, I want people to feel at peace. So hallelujah, so be it. I love that. <laughs> I love that. It's, it's interesting because I, you know, experienced something very similar with my name. You know, my dad, mm -hmm. Um, my dad named all of us, all five of us. And our first, you know, the first set that, you know, we call ourselves the original three musketeers. We all have <laughs> with the letter K and then the, the youngest two have names that began with the letter D because my parents' names are Kevin and Daria. And so I remember oh, wow. being, gosh, probably as young as like seven, seven years old and being in uh, schools or you know classrooms that were predominantly white settings and me being the only one who looked like me the only one with any melanin you know in their skin um in class and having teachers mispronounce my name and mm -hmm. it wasn't until i was in like the sixth grade that i had one teacher mrs dumont and she was a very sweet woman and she my first day in class literally had me come up to the front of the room and she stood with me and she said you tell us how to say your name and she mm -hmm. on the board phonetically. And at the time I felt seen, even though in hindsight, I'm like, was that a good thing? In the moment, it felt like a good thing. It felt mm -hmm. like she was making her best efforts in her, you know, in her, in her experience as a teacher to make sure that no one mispronounced my name. And right. I got Kaisian, Keysian, Kaisine, all these things. And I'm like, it's key, Sean. It's two syllables, key, Sean. So just, it's Sean, like Sean, 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 key, like the key that goes in the door. And for a while, I had started giving myself nicknames. You know, I was Justice in high school. Then I just went by Sean for a while. And then other times I went by Key, just because that was me trying to like modify my name so that it was more palatable to other people. And it wasn't mm. until I got to a certain stage of just conviction with my own identity that I started using my full name as my professional name, the name that goes on all my branding, the name that I introduced myself with because I no longer wanted to try to modify it to fit what other people's needs were. So, right. Yeah. Right. And strengthening that I don't give a fuck muscle. Yes. That's really what it is at the end of the day. Like that's what all of this is about. It's about unlearning everything that we've ever learned, learning not to give a fuck and focusing on yourself. 
And, and being selfish is one of the selfless things you can do in this world. Because if, if we spend more time focusing on our inner selves and our inner work, it would be easier for us to navigate with other people because they're doing the same thing. Exactly, exactly. And recognizing that really being selfish is being self full, like full of oneself and over mm -hmm. and able to connect with other people instead of it being, instead of it being this thing that has this ne negative connotation attached to it that says, well, you're being selfish and you're being self-centered. And it's like, well, shouldn't I be at the center of myself? Who else should be in here? <laughs> like, yeah. what? I don't understand who else am I holding space for within myself if I'm not holding space for myself first. That just, it doesn't quite math. It doesn't quite gel, you know? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a little bit about spirituality. What does mm -hmm. spirituality mean for you? What does that look like for you? Uh, spirituality for me means being honest with myself. I don't, I don't necessarily have a specific formula or or deity or anything or rituals of that sort it's, it's uh i just it's more so my opportunity to become close with myself to have intimacy into me i see a uh, type of experience and part of that experience is i meditate daily i check in with myself on a normal basis, don't get me wrong, I love me some crystals, I'm wearing a centrine right now. <laughs> I, I really enjoy uh, metaphysics. I think astrology is so much fun. I don't think it's the all and be all of who someone is, but I think it's a lot of fun and, and a little uncanny to be honest. Uh, you know, it's just my way of, of, like I said, being honest and connecting with myself, my, my truth, my center, where I'm at and naturally i attract other people who are on the same wavelength and and they also have similar ways of defining their spirituality uh basically my spirituality is for me and it's very intimate i don't necessarily broadcast it or share it with the world i don't i don't need attention in that in that space i just i love being so whole and connected within me and my spirituality is a huge compliment to that and it means everything to me it's it's my peace yeah yeah I love that it's I think that the more that I've learned that my spiritual relationship is really about a relationship that happens internally as opposed to mm -hmm. externally trying to reach for things or trying to look for answers or trying to find right. things that make sense and really recognizing that it all makes sense in here it doesn't have to make sense to anyone else or for anyone else. And mm -hmm. the same, you know, I had a similar experience, you know, growing up, my experience growing up in a, a heavily religious household and a heavily, you know, Christian influenced environment, and then leaving home, you know, going away, going out into the world and really finding that I was a seeker of, of more information and a, a greater understanding of the whys of the world. And I felt like mm -hmm. when I reached a point where I studied you know, Hinduism and studied Buddhism and studied all these different practices that they all really pointed back to me. And so once I recognized that I stopped seeking, you know, I stopped searching and really just started understanding or understanding, like you said, getting to a place of, oh, okay. So I do know what the fuck I'm talking about. And I do mm -hmm. have the ability to really trust myself. And I don't really need to seek anything outside of myself. Or, mm -hmm. I got this. Oh, I got this. Okay, cool. And that was really absolving for me because it really helped to pause that need to try to look for external validation in so many different areas when spirituality is really very much rooted in a relationship with self versus a relationship with anything outside of ourselves so exactly the those who hold the problem also hold the solution everything that we feel on the inside we manifest on the outside as well so if you can change your mind you can change your reality really is what it is and i know that it'll take some time because some people look for quick fixes when it comes to spirituality, I've noticed, especially when it comes to say like the law of attraction and alchemy and things of that sort. Yes, absolutely. Once again, you change your mind, you can change your reality, but also keep in mind that momentum takes time. You get to practice that mindset while the reality shifts with you. So it's about being patient and understanding and being being still and being comfortable with all the things that come along. Cause it's not you that, I'm sorry, it's not the world that needs 
things change. It's your mindset, the way that you respond to it. I've gotten to the point of my life where hardly if ever react to anything. I just look at it and I, and I observe and I'm, and I'm sure I'm gonna have to eat these words sooner or later. As soon as you put it out there, something comes. So you know what, bring on the shit guys, let's go. <laughs> but either way, I have, I have literally trained myself to be stoic. It doesn't mean that I don't have reasons to be upset. It doesn't mean that I still don't sometimes attach stories and beliefs to the things that come up for me. I'm, I mean, even at this moment, as I'm speaking to you, I'm healing from, from some recent trauma that has been hurting me and plaguing me for over a year. But I've decided at this point in my life that I've got this. Yeah. I've got this. Strictly because I'm choosing to respond to things differently. Not it's going to stop coming. Not things aren't going to continuously go wrong here and there. Or even go right. Even when things go right, I'm still stoic. I actually, I have friends that make fun of me. But like, Hallie, you don't really, like, you don't just, when you're happy, like, why don't you just, bah! And I said, because ah, I'm just still, like, I'm, I'm just observing things. And, you know, if something really is funny or really interesting, I will respond with a natural emotion. But for the most part, because I trained myself to be still, I'm completely unbothered by what happens or what doesn't happen. Especially since, once again, I'm not afraid of my emotions. If I feel pissed, I'm going to rage out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it happen. If I feel really, really happy, I'm going to smile so big. If I experience love, I'm going to take all that love, let it be just in me, and then I'm also going to express it outwards. I'm just so unapologetic about every level and variation of myself that I don't care. <laughs> this, is, this is what it comes down to. I don't care. I don't care. Alex. And I'm so, I, thank you. I'm so, I'm just, I'm feeling very like understood right now, just listening because Aww. I have had such a similar experience with, you know, astrologically speaking, I'm a Cancer sun and a Sagittarius moon. So oh, wow. very different, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you think about it and, you know, I, I recognize that I've had similar experiences with peers and friends and family where they're like, well, Keisha, I'm like, let us see something come from you. You're this cancer. You're supposed to be emotional. Mm -hmm. You're be breaking down. And it's like, no, I don't have to do that. I, I can be very empathetic and I can be very aware and in tune and attuned. And I can also maintain my equilibrium, which right. Feels that reaction is for them, not for you. Exactly. It's really, it's really what it is. It's really, it's like, oh, do you want me to do this? Okay, yeah, I'm surprised. Are you good now? Okay, can I <laughs> just chill? Because I spent, um, I spent a lot of time and energy and effort learning this. Like you said, teaching yourself how to be stoic. I learned to teach myself how to maintain a sense of peace no matter what. You know, no matter what is going on, no matter what external things are happening, maintaining a sense of peace, because that's what allows me to maintain a sense of clarity. And that right. allows me to maintain a sense of freedom, freedom from the need to react to every single thing was like literally like loosening like chains of bondage, like, oh, wait, so I don't. Okay. So I don't even have to, I could just, I could just chill. Oh, I love this. I should have learned this a long time ago. You know, so now that I, mm -hmm. it, I think that I, I operate in a state of peace. I operate in a state of calm. And like you said, it doesn't mean that shit doesn't happen because shit happens. That's just part of this mm -hmm. life. You know, that's part of our experience. That's also part of, I think, the lessons that we attract and the things that we want to learn is through the shit that happens. However, when it happens, I don't have to lose my shit unless I choose to. <laughs> that, that part I was about to say unless you want to lose your shit you can decide you can decide at any at any point what you want to do you really yeah. can I, I don't I don't really feel like a victim to much of anything even though I know I've been victimized even though I stood I knew I was standing in my victimhood I knew I was attracting things that helped me feed that victim mentality I knew deep down I'm not a victim I'm choosing this experience right now I'm choosing to, to be in it and be present in it. Um, and, and it's a balance because I know that my mindset 
if it's too much of it, it can be dangerous mm -hmm. because it prevents it prevents uh, other people from taking accountability for the things that they do. If I'm constantly saying, oh, you know, I, I tried to do this. So that's why I say my spirituality is private, because if I told more people what's on my mind and what I think, they could try to parrot it where they, they try to repeat it back and regurgitate in ways that think they work for them, try to get reactions out of me, try to find out more. And I'm like, no, just leave me alone. That's why I don't say much. Right. I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm most of the time, I'm the most observant person in the room. Um, and if I feel like being loud, I'll be loud. But yeah. I mostly, I mostly speak out of intention uh, or out of balance. Like, for instance, if I'm in a room and, and I'm around people who are really quiet, I'm going to speak so that we can carry a conversation. And then once the conversation starts, if I feel like being a part of it, I will. If I don't, then I won't. Yeah. It's that simple for me. And I got to this place because my life used to be very much so not simple, very traumatic. I was always angry. I was always hurt. I was always taking things personally. I was always the victim of some sort of tragic event. I was never happy, no matter how much I accomplished, no matter how much I got done, no, no matter how successful I seemed, I was so unhappy. And I realized all the time it was because I was still living for others and I was still vibrating in a traumatic space. And living for others is a part of the trauma because it, it, it prevents me from accepting things as it is and allow me to create what I want in the process. Right. I hope that makes sense. That makes so <laughs> much sense. I'm like, okay, universe, are you just having her talk? So <laughs> oh, jeez. So I can feel validated, <laughs> so I can feel seen because it's, living for others in itself is a trauma cycle and mm -hmm. I don't think that people necessarily recognize that I was just having a conversation last night with one of my sisters and we're dealing with some family trauma drama um mm -hmm. drama that's rooted in old trauma that never got dealt with never got talked about and it's kind of coming up it's bubbling to the surface and I was talking to my sister last night and I told her I said you know we were given such high expectations as children. We had the bar set extremely high. And while it was motivating and it was encouraging and it was inspiring, once we got to the point where we realized, well, wait a minute, I don't even want that. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in setting my bar really high in these areas that I really feel connected to. I don't necessarily want to be a star athlete. I don't necessarily want to be a famous, you know, painter or something, or I don't want to be a teacher. I want to be this. And so if I can apply that same level of motivation and expectation to the things that I really want to do, I'm probably going to feel differently. But we got to this place where um, there was a recognition that happened that said, oh, our parents created an environment for us that applied so much pressure to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. that now we're recognizing we don't have to be that anymore and if we relieve that pressure if we take off that you know that weight or that baggage and just be who we are you know like you said flexing that I don't give a fuck muscle a little bit more no disrespect mm -hmm. dad we love you the best you feel with what you had but we're going to do this now so there's actually like a shift that's happening you know in my family where there's like an energetic shift that's taking place that says this is the way that we've been living in this trauma cycle. And this is the way we're going to live now without that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's powerful. So that's why I'm like, okay, this conversation is just happening at the most perfect time. It couldn't be <laughs> more perfect. Well, well then, um, then I'll take the, the little tears I saw as tears of joy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I may have a lot of, I don't give a fuck at me, but I also like, I don't want to make you cry. Dang. No. <laughs> No, it's so, it's the, it's the sense of like, it's confirmation. You know what I mean? Sometimes like I'm the type of person who asks, you know, ancestors and, you know, spirit guides and source, like, show me signs. I like to see, I'm a visual person. And so anytime I get those moments of confirmation that are like, yep, keep going, Keyshawn. Yes, this is the direction you need to keep, keep moving in. I like the occasional cheerleader good job thumbs up I like those oh, okay well you know what I I am happy to show up as your spiritual sage and say good job thank you I appreciate <laughs> that I appreciate that no it, it's all it's all good stuff all good things so I want to I want to switch gears just a little bit um I know when I send out my questionnaire 
I like to have these really, what I consider to be creative questions that I ask people. And one of the questions that I ask is, if you woke up tomorrow morning with $100 million in your bank account, what would you do first? And the first answer that you said was to research ways to invest buy a nice dinner and meditate to create an action plan on ways to create a team and take over the world. I love that. Yeah. That was, and awesome. I'm sure at the moment I meant it, but right now when you <laughs> asked me that question, you know, the first thing I said, I said, I'm going to disappear. No one's ever going to know. I'm going to be gone. <laughs> I'm going to just, I'm going to just go. I'm going to just explore. I'm going to do, I'm going to do what I feel best, but I'm, I'm still going to do all those things too. Cause I know when I'm done being a little kid running amok, I'm going to have to like come back and be an adult and blah, blah, blah. Who knows? But yeah, I'll, I'll still do all those things. I'll still <laughs> all those things. But right now, hallelujah said, I'm going to go. I'm going to go explore. I'm going to have fun. You're not going to be able to find me. Where's Waldo? I don't know. Can't find him. I'm not dropping a pin. I'm not sharing my location. I'm just, I'm out. I'm out. No, the only one, the only one that's going to know is my mama and probably like one or two closest friends. There you go. <laughs> just, you know, for emergencies, just in case, you know, we need to plan an exit strategy of some kind or something like but that. I'm not, yeah, but I'm going to go on a vacation. I'm going to take myself on a well uh, received if I want to say the word earned, um, you know, I, I think it's just like, you know, it's time to pamper me. And I, I pamper myself on a normal basis. Like that's part of my self-care. Uh, however, you know, if I, if I had a hundred million dollars, I just showed up at my bank account in the morning. Um, yes, please. I, I receive it. In fact, let's just, let's just manifest that right now. Hello universe. How are you doing? A um, hundred million dollars, please. I'd be happy to wake up with that in the morning. Thank you gratitude i receive it okay. yes i i feel you that's one of the reasons i love asking that question is because i think that just giving ourselves an opportunity to even imagine you know what that would look like feel like and what we would do you know is is a, is a good feeling you know exercise without any of the stress and the worry and all that kind of shit is just like okay so what would mm -hmm. i get here i love that book me a flight to somewhere <laughs> to somewhere else it's not where yeah. right? somewhere else I, love I, I feel it I feel it every day to be honest uh that's why when it happened I won't be surprised I'm not gonna be like too good to be true I'm gonna be like it's about damn time that's that's really what it is like <laughs> hey you know, this is this is my worth this this is just a portion of my worth my birthright I am not shocked when great things happen to me because I always expect it to happen to me I love that I think that being in the expectation of, of great things happening is also sometimes shocking to other people like i i remember i had this friend her name was joy that was literally her name was joy and oh. one of her like affirming ways that she would introduce herself to people is like my name is joy and i always expect joy and you should too and i was like wow that's really that's really refreshing i've never heard anyone introduce themselves like that expecting joy expecting greatness i love it so i like to do this little interaction on my podcast called complete the sentence so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a couple sentence prompts and then you can complete them taking up as much or as little space as you'd like. The first one is I am happiest when. I am happiest when I am in a state of calm. This is a state of, of calm. I don't even need to be certain. I don't, I don't need to know everything. I don't need to control anything. I don't care whether I'm happy or sad. I just feel calm balance mm. i like that how about i know i'm fed up when i know i'm fed up when i want absolutely nothing to do with it anymore and i'm no longer offended by how it's existing but i'm more so interested how can i exist without it mm. i know i've made an impact when i know i've made an impact when I see the changes occurring almost automatically. So how about we're gonna take a little trip in a time machine and we're gonna go back. Time machine, my favorite, let's go. <laughs> can I close my eyes? You can close your eyes. I'm gonna close my eyes, all right, let's do it. Okay, yeah, we're gonna take a little trip and we're gonna go back to when you were 16 you step out of your time machine 
and you find mm -hmm. your 16 year old self, what is the first thing that you say? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna tell her to come here. I got you. I'm gonna hold her, I'm gonna let her cry. I'm gonna validate her for everything that she's experiencing. And I'm gonna tell her, hey, look at me. Look at me, hold on, you're almost there. You're almost there, just, just, just keep pushing, keep doing it. Um, but I wouldn't do anything for her other than hold her, be there for her, protect her, take care of her, because I didn't have that. Yeah, that's good. Now you're going to make me cry. Oh, my God. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <sighs> so now we're going to step back into our time machine. And we're going to go forward all the way to the end. We don't know exactly how far forward we're going to go, but this is mm -hmm. the very last stage of you in this life. What do you want to be remembered for? Mm. Oh, <laughs> what do I want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered for dying completely and utterly empty. And I say that because if I died empty, that means I gave it my all. Yeah, that's what I want to be remembered for. And honestly, I could care less whether other people remember it or not. I, I more so want to remember it myself. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. Well, the last thing I like to do on my podcast is to share a little bit of an oracle reading. Ooh, let's do it. I love oracle reading. Mm -mm. This mm -mm. is a really cool deck that I've been working with for years now, I should say. Um, and it's exactly a deck of 52 cards. So I like to pull one for today's date, which is the 24th. And then the second card, you can just pick a number between one and 52. One and 52? Mm -hmm. um, 17. 17, okay. I love it. Let's see. All right. I don't. I'm like, why did I pick that number? I know, that's the one you Could have picked a sex <laughs> one. But sure, I'll just take, I'll take 17. No one ever picked 17, so I feel excited that it got chosen. <laughs> so the <laughs> are super lighthearted and kind of funny. So the message for number 17 is baggage be gone. Yes! Yes! That's why I chose it. Ah, let's go. Yes! So there's a little guidebook that shares a little more. So baggage be gone. <clears throat> the message is, come on now. Aren't you tired of being stooped over from all that emotional baggage? The thing yes. is, it all happened yesterday. This is now. And with one flick of your powerful energetic finger, you can send all that old has-been baggage overboard into the drink. It's time mm. to fly free. Let it go, my friend. Oh. I receive it. Okay, I'm not mad at 17. Boop, let's be flicking it away. This is great. I love this. <laughs> and the second card is 24, and the message is, I got your back. Ain't that interesting? I How got your she? back. So 24's message says, <clears throat> you can spit in the face of fear, flip off those who bar the door, shake your fist to anyone who dares say no because you, sweet thing, are divinely protected by the Most High, always and forever. Ashe, mm, Ashe, Ashe. I've received all of that. So you're telling me that I get to release the baggage and be protected at the same exact time? Oh, the world ain't ready. The world ain't ready for me. I'm about to run them up. I already know. I already know. <laughs> you know, drop a pin with you <laughs> wherever it is you about to go. <laughs> I'll be like, I'll be like, hey, Gijan, what you, what you up to, girl? Okay, what you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this was such a delight. I'm so glad we had a chance to sit down and I just love the, the fluidity of this conversation. I am, um, I appreciate you for your, your presence and for your, your choice to live wholly and completely as you are. This has been inspiring for me. This has been affirming for me. So thank you for just being a voice of, of truth and wisdom and for and essentially being a channel for messages that apparently I really needed to hear today. Thank you for that. 
I just mm -hmm. want to send you with, with love and light, peace, prosperity, and protection in all the things that you do as you go forward. Thank you, thank you, thank you, hallelujah, for being here. And uh, yeah, this has been wonderful. I, you know what, I received that. And for the sake of reciprocity, I have a question for you too. Okay. What does Kishan mean right mm -hmm. now? Kishan needs stillness and rest. Hmm. Well, then it's yours. Go get it. I received that. This is the last thing I have to do today. So it's coming uh, right after. <laughs> beautiful. That's what we like to hear. Yes. It'll we'll close the computer and shut it all down. So yeah, thank you. I'm with you on that. We're gonna be disc we're gonna be decompressing together, not together. I love it. I love yep. it. Well, I appreciate you and we will be in touch very soon. Sounds good. Okay, see. Bye.